introduce me to mobility studies. So I'm from Montreal and I think it's important to say a few words about what it means for me because I use a wheelchair. So getting around Montreal is extremely difficult because public transit is not really accessible. Um, I know that there's a lot of issues in the UK but in Montreal it's even worse. Um, so I navigate uh, within all those kind of oppressions, but also privileges in my own city. And I, I will basically everywhere, because I cannot really use public transportation. So for years, I just will, you know, from my home to the university, to work, uh, to my friends, e everywhere I could, um, because it, it turned out that it was the most efficient way for me to get around the city. So I spent a lot of time just wheeling and just thinking, but without really, you know, knowing that maybe this was something interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Took me a few a few years. Um, so I'm doing a PhD at Concordia University in the program called Humanities, um, and it's like a combination of three different fields. So I'm studying uh, oral history, geography, communication, mobility studies um, and yeah so I was interested in disabled people's sense of belonging in their own city because I guess I'm, I'm struggling with that myself um, so I was like okay so I'm gonna go and you know talk to people because this is where the knowledge is this is where the history is because in terms of disability um, there's not much written especially in, in Quebec uh, in French disability studies is not really something yet well it's just it's, it's beginning um yeah so then i had an opportunity to go to new york city to do interviews there too and i was like oh that th this could be interesting not to compare montreal and new york because it's just not that interesting i think to compare two cities it's more like to bring two different perspectives so those two cities are so different in terms of history culture uh, access access law it's very different you know in the states they have the ada um and also poor access can you hear me well uh, yes it's fine uh, poor access because even though you know the states has some how it, strong legislation in terms of access new york is still very difficult to get around um and yes i i'm i'm inspired by the work of michel de certo and also by the work of many of you in this room today. <laughs> so in the practices of everyday life, the Sarto describes belonging as a sentiment which is built up and grows with time of everyday, and time out of everyday life activities and use of space. And the Sarto privileges walking as a mean of bu building this sense of belonging. And he explains that accumulated knowledge, memory, and intimate corporal experiences are gained through walking practices. And in mobility studies, it relates a lot to that. Here I have a quote from Monica, John, and uh, Katia Witschker. Um, they claim that bodies make sense, body sense and make sense of the world as they move bodily in and through it, creating discursively mediated sensecapes that signified so social taste and distinction, ideology, and meaning. And here I have a quote from Kim. Uh, she says, uh, if indeed we experience the world as we move through it, then how we move th through it, by foot, bike, car, by wheelchair, and at what speed, in what form, and using what practices in those environments matters. And despite the growing literature in mo mo on mobile method, and walking interviews, little is known about what it means to wheel. Um, and while walking, running, dancing, flying, are recognized as mobile practices, wheeling has not been identified as such yet. And um, walking is generally understood as a very normalized practice within a set of specific uh, able-bodied uh, capacities. So it's, it's normalized in most of the literature. 
Um, so yeah, the fact that I don't walk, that I will, that, that means something. And it does not mean that I don't identify as a pedestrian. It is complicated and it matters. What does it mean to conduct walking interviews when you don't walk, like society expects you to walk? There's no research without methods. Our methodological approaches shape our research. The methods we choose influence how the research will be conducted and directly impact our results. So in this um, draft, uh, I explore the predominance of the normalized walking interviews in the literature, and then I'll share some thoughts about wheeling as a mobile practice through my own experience and through my experience in, of conducting wheeling interviews in, in New York City, because I haven't done my interviews in Montreal yet. I'm supposed to do this before winter arrives. <laughs> So yes, so walking interviews are used as a method by many researchers inside and outside academia. There are several reasons that researchers may, may choose walking interviews as method. Walking interviews have the potential to, ask, to access a local community's knowledge about their surrounding environment and, this, and to facilitate both the emergence of particular memories and collaborative knowledge. The growing interest in walking interviews is also strongly connected with the recognition of walking as a social practice that actively shapes the cities we live in. So the CERTO sees in walking a mean to constantly alter a landscape simply by moving through it. He also terrorizes walking as a subversive, subversive political act based on the tactics of everyday walker. So walking has a lot of uh, you know, power in, into it. Uh, and walking is also value in our societies uh, because it's often connected with ideals of health and freedom. The physical capacity is, is, this physical capacity is regularly assumed to be natural <coughs> for all human and is largely accepted as a signifier of well-being. So if you walk, it means that you're healthy and, and things are going not so bad for you, maybe. Uh, Rebecca Solnit connects the heart, our act of walking to bodily functions as fundamental as breathing. She, she wrote, uh, walking generates a rhythm of thinking. She argues that the mind and the feet operate at the same speed. She quotes a philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who claimed, I can only med meditate when I'm walking. When I stop, I cease to think. My mind only works with my legs. Simply put, this conceptualiza conceptualization of walking is based on the ideal of able bodiness. A typical walker is not expected to be able to run a marathon, However, a typical walker is expected to be able to cross a street within a specific amount of time. The same thing can be said about the minds. Minds are supposed to function in certain ways, to fall under the umbrella of neurotypical capacities. And these are manifestations of ableism. And here I have a quote from Fiona Crumey Campbell. Uh, she defines ableism as a network of beliefs processes and practices that produce a particular kind of self and body, which is like a corporal standard that is projected as the perfect species, species typical and therefore essential to be uh, recognized as fully human. But all those standards are not fixed in, in time. Uh, they, they vary according to many different factors and they are really located in specific cultural and historical context. For example, Gregor Wolverine uh, explains that the normal legs are on only considered uh, the norm within the specific cultural context. Uh, for example, he's, he says that in a few years, if we manage to uh, invent you know, those super, super legs, then the regular legs could become the disabled one. And we have seen this kind of issues uh, during the last 
Summer Olympic with Oscar Pistorius. Um, and well, ableism is a system of oppression that remains poorly understood in academia um, and, and you know, not, not often researched or taught about or considered, you know, in, in that list of ism. <laughs> and it should be, uh, you know, considered, ob obviously. Um, and academia itself is still a space where the production of ableism occurs and thus is hostile to many disabled people, especially those experiencing multiple systems of oppression. So ableis ableism can be very obvious, like maybe a set of stairs in front out of, of a building, but it can also be very subtle and be constituted of very good <coughs> intentions. So it's not surprising that there is not much written about disability um, in academia, in critical uh, disciplines, um, and mobility studies. Um, so I did a, a quick research in the Journal of Mobilities, and all the articles that were featuring walking interviews um, seems to be conducted by an uh, able-bodied researcher. Or if it's not, it was not you know, put in forefront. There's also all those, that question of having to disclose when you have a disability and, and when you have, you don't. So maybe, you know, maybe there's some, someone there who was disabled but didn't, you know, claim that, that she was disabled. So wheeling as a mobile practice, it's really just the beginning of something. So this is, I guess, why I'm, I'm here. So I'm gonna share some, some thoughts that I've been reading, uh, writing. So unlike walking, Wheeling is neither valued in social science research nor in, West, in Western cultures. In the media, moving using a wheelchair is either considered as a tragedy or as a heroic act. You know, sometimes I just go outside and people congratulate me to, to exist. <laughs> <laughs> Unless they receive social praise for sports as Paralympic athletes do, Wheelchair users are often described as being confined in or bound to their wheelchair. The wheelchair is regularly used in campaigns promoting safe driving and safe diving and healthy life choices. For example, in the spring of 2015, a public service announcement about osteoporosis prevention was released in the United States, so the campaign sparked uh, outrage in the U.S. disability community. The ad, which was removed from hair due to, due to their mobilization, featured an empty manual wheelchair chasing down walkers in a, in a shopping, shopping mall. Creepy horror film movie music played in the background. The message was, stand up to osteoporosis before you can't. This type of media representation contributes to the construction of wheeling as being nothing but negative and occurring in opposition to walking. There's also all these uh, uh, very popular uh, wheeling simulations, you know, when you, you want to sensitize people to accessibility, so you organize those kind of activities where you spend a day in a wheelchair to know what it feels like, and here I have a quote of late disability rights activist and comedian journalist Stella Young. She argued that disability simulation fails to capture the nuance, the nuance and complexity of living in a disabled body. And it certainly fails to give a deep understanding of systematic discrimination and abuse faced by disabled people. This representation of willing are a result of power relation devaluating the disabled experience as a, uh, as a way of knowing the world. Another aspect of wheeling, uh, wheeling does not come in only one form. Who has access to wheelchair varies from one jurisdiction to another and is located within a specific historical context. There are different types of wheelchairs and scooters. Some people have to pay for their wheelchairs, while others have them covered by private or public health insurance. 